Harvard Divinity School. Are psychedelics theologically significant for Judaism? April 27th, 2023. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Charles Stang, and I have the privilege of serving as the director of the Center for the Study of World Religions here at Harvard Divinity School. So welcome to this afternoon's event, a panel discussion taking up the question, are psychedelics theologically significant for Judaism? Uh, this panel is this year's last event in our very popular series on psychedelics and the future of religion, which is in turn part of the Center's Transcendence and Transformation Initiative, or TNT as we call it, now concluding its second year. I would like to thank our two co-sponsors, the Richard C. Dinner Center for Jewish Studies at the Graduate Theological Union and Shefa, an organization devoted to Jewish psychedelical, psychedelic support. And I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Rachel Peterson for all her invaluable help in bringing this panel together. Um, I will soon introduce Zach Kamenitz, founder and CEO of Shefa, uh, who will in turn introduce our three panelists. But before I do that, I wanna make an important announcement. TNT's new podcast, Pop Apocalypse, is now live. Hosted by TNT postdoctoral fellow, Matthew J. Dillon, this podcast explores the mystical and the mythic, the paranormal and the psychedelic in popular culture. Two episodes have been released so far, both of which uh, might be of interest to this audience. The first is entitled Waking from the Flesh Dream, and it features visionary artists Alex and Allison Gray, and it takes up their early performance art, the ecstatic experiences behind their paintings, the history of their Chapel of Sacred Mirrors, and the culture shift around psychedelics in the last 20 years. The second episode, entitled Psychedelic Gnosis and the Imaginal Double, features the visionary artist, novel, and historian Lawrence Caruana. I've listened to the first episode and in full, and it's riveting, and I'm looking forward to diving into the second uh, this weekend. So as always, the best way to stay abreast of what we're doing here at the Center, and especially our online public programming, is to sign up for our weekly newsletter. We will drop links to the podcast and to the newsletter in the chat function. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce Zach Kamenitz, founder and CEO of Shefa. Zach is a rabbi and community leader based in Berkeley, California. He holds an MA in Biblical Literatures, uh, Literature and Languages from UC Berkeley and the Graduate Theological Union, and he received rabbinic ordination in 2012. As the founder and CEO of Shefa, the first organization dedicated to Jewish psychedelic support, Zach is pioneering a movement to integrate safe and supported psychedelic use into the Jewish spiritual tradition advocating for individuals and communities to heal personal and communal traumas and inspiring a Jewish religious and creative renaissance in the 21st century. So I will soon disappear and Zach will appear to introduce our three panelists and I will return around 1 p.m. Uh, when we open to conversation, uh, when we open the conversation to audience questions. So those of you who are joining us, uh, if you'd like to pose a question or a comment, please do so with the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And please indicate if you'd prefer that your question remain anonymous. If we have time only for some of the questions, which I expect given how many people uh, I've joined, uh, I, wanna rest, I want you to assure you that we will pass on all the questions and the comments to the panelists so that they can see what their remarks have provoked in you. So without further ado, Zach, the floor is yours. Thank you, Charlie, and thanks to the Center for hosting us today, as well as the Graduate Theological Union for co-sponsoring today's event. My name is Rabbi Zach Kamenetz, and I also want to thank Rachel Peterson, who is a graduate student researcher at Harvard Div, and my friend and colleague, who encouraged me to convene this panel on behalf of Shefa and the growing community of psychedelically engaged and curious Jews around the world. As we settle into this phase of the reemergence of psychedelics as medicines and allies for personal and communal inner exploration, we think it is vital to begin exploring this, the implications of their adoption 
by spiritual and religious traditions without continuous lineages or legacies of psychedelic use, as well as evolving beyond perennial models of consciousness and reality, which often allied critical nuances within particular traditions. Today's panel is an attempt to elevate the discourse, both in the Jewish and psychedelic fields, and bring the conversations happening within the Jewish psychedelic community to a wider audience. Thank you for playing and discovering with us. I'd like to introduce today's moderator and panelists. Sam Shankoff is the Toby Family Assistant Professor of Jewish Studies at the Graduate Theological Union. His research focuses on modern Jewish modes of spirituality, particularly in German Jewish Hasidic and Neo Hasidic contexts. He is the co editor of Hasidism, Writing on Devotion, Community, and Life in the Modern World, editor of Martin Buber, his intellectual and scholarly legacy, and his essays have appeared recently in the Journal of Religion, Journal of Jewish Thought and Philosophy, and the Rutledge Handbook of Religion and the Body. Shankoff is also a collaborator with the UC Berkeley Center for its Science of, Psych Science of Psychedelics. Malila Helner Eshed is a Senior Research Fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. She has taught for the past 25 years on Jewish mysticism and the Zohar at Hebrew University in Jerusalem and serves on the faculty of the Institute of Jewish Spirituality. Her publications include A River Flows from Eden, The Language of Mystical Experience in the Zohar, Seekers of the Face, The Secrets of the Idra Rabbah in the Zohar, and her new book, co-written with Omri Shasha, On the Path of the Tree of Life, An Introduction to the Zohar, is forthcoming. Malila is, an act is active in the Sulha community, a reconciliation project that brings together Israelis and Palestinians. And finally, Rabbi Dr. J. Michelson, who is affiliated with the, uh, with the Chicago Theological Seminary and the author of nine books on Judaism and contemplative practice. His most recent, The Heresy of Jacob Frank, From Jewish Messianism to Esoteric Myth, won the two, tw 2022 National Jewish Book Award. Outside the Academy, J. has been writing about Judaism and psychedelics for 15 years and taught meditation in Jewish, Buddhist, and secular contexts for 20 years. Jay's next book and his first work of fiction, The Secret That Is Not a Secret, 10 Heretical Tales, published by Iron Press, will be out in December. Thank you, friends. Take it away. Thank you, Rabbi Zach. Uh, thank you so much to the Harvard Divinity School, the Center for the Study of World Religions, Charles Stang and Rachel Peterson, everyone who helped to make this program possible. Um, I'm thrilled to have this conversation uh, with you, Jay and Malila, and I figured we would begin with each of us just sort of responding with some opening personal reflections on this question of um, are psychedelics theologically significant for Judaism as a way of really throwing some logs on the fire for our discussion that's coming. Um, it's kind of a bold chutzpahdik question <laughs> to try to answer. Like I'd say my, um, I'll, I'll open up with some reflections here. Um, are psychedelics theologically significant for Judaism is a deeply personal question for different people, but I'll speak from my own vantage point with, with, um, with three aspects here. Um, as a scholar of Jewish mysticism, um, I am interested in ways that experiences of human divine encounter, um, let alone the expressions of those experiences, are perhaps uncontrollable, transcendent in some sense, but also always historically situated and hermeneutically textured. Um, so that's to say I'm interested in how revelatory experiences generate new theology and how that theology in turn um, generates new experiences. As Jeffrey Kripal puts it in a line that I love, experience can catalyze new interpretation just as interpretation can catalyze new experience. So I, my own scholarship focuses on the modern period. So whether there is some like deep ancestral history of intersections between Judaism and psychedelics uh, in ancient Israel um, or in other periods long ago, I kind of will defer to them on this. From what I can see um, in my own area of research, 
I see this as a, as a relatively new phenomenon, this intersection between psychedelics and Jewish tradition in a robust way, um, really being about half a century old for all intents and purposes. And so I wonder, um, how does Jews having psychedelic experiences change the ways in which Jews understands the divine? And how do those understandings and expressions after um, alter Jewish spirituality more broadly, which then in turn uh, both produces new theological sources and produces new interpretations of older theological sources, and you see the sort of hermeneutical circle here. Um, that that uh, interplay is very interesting to me and seems significant in terms of um, understanding the um, the impact that psychedelic experiences and substances will will have on Jewish theology. Um, in my own work, I'm also uh, I'm also working on a project that uses. Uh, a movement called neo-Hasidism as a case study here. Um, Hasidism itself is an early modern Eastern European uh, movement of Jewish mysticism. And neo-Hasidism, really a 20th century phenomenon uh, and through the present day, um, it refers to Jews who are not Hasidic themselves, generally um, more secular, but not necessarily, who are nonetheless drawing upon Hasidism, Hasidic sources, tales, melodies, aesthetics, and so on, for their own purposes of spiritual or cultural renewal. Um, and it so happens that especially in um, a kind of second wave of neo-Hasidism in North America, really starting in the 60s, um, psychedelics actually do play a quite pivotal role um, in the trajectory and the unfolding of this movement of neo-Hasidism. Um, and, and I'm interested in looking at what's going on interpretively, hermeneutically at that confluence um, and observing ways in which um, ways in which these uh, participants and leaders of this movement are refracting Hasidism through the prism of psychedelics. And also the other way around, refracting psychedelics themselves through the prism of Hasidism, how uh, the tradition itself and those sources and practices are, are um, transforming their understanding of those substances. Um, and I think that this, this case study, um, and there are others, um, help us think about like what does it even mean to have this, this theological uh, interplay between psychedelics and, and a tradition. And I'll just say, finally, um, that also as somebody who's a historian of modern Jewish culture and modern Jewish religiosity, I'm, I'm attentive to ways in which, um, particularly in the European and North American contexts, um, the Jewish mystical tradition was quite explicitly, systematically swept under the rug, um, starting really in the 18th century and the Enlightenment. Um, spiritual techniques um, and paradigms that had been quite mainstream in, in Jewish practice for centuries at that point um, were, were suppressed um, and, and, um, and projected outwards. Um, and so I think that um, today we can think of Jewish engagement with psychedelics as some people's attempt to be a sort of jumpstart for inert engines <laughs> um, or a, a kind of shock treatment for atrophied spirits in some way, um, perhaps a transitional moment, perhaps something that will continue to endure and, and, and deepen roots in the tradition. Um, these remain open questions. Um, and whether that is theologically significant in the end, in my mind, will depend on the extent to which those experiences reinvigorate, renew, and perhaps revolutionize Jewish plunges into the various media of Jewish theology, specifically uh, Jewish sources, Jewish sources, Jewish practices, um, broadly conceived. 
Um, and again, that remains an open question, I think, um, one that has already been evolving for at least half a century or so, but one that I suspect uh, we're still at a quite early phase in. Um, I will, I'd like to pass it off, please, to you, Malila. Hey, thanks, Sam. Hello, everybody out there. I'm speaking to you from Jerusalem. It's evening time. Um, uh, I'm delighted to be on this panel with these two lovely people. And um, um, I, I want to say as well, maybe that's the place where you started, but like the way I would formulate the basic question would first of all be, you know, might there, yeah, I'll ask, might there be theological, theologically significant aspects to the um, use of psychedelics, you know, within, within the Jewish within Jewish uh, religious culture, spiritual culture. Um, and I'm, you know, I am coming to this question with, uh, with a nava, with humility. I'm, we're looking at things that are new and uh, we have to move between the audacity and chutzpah and, uh, and a place of actually just observing things. So um, I wanna say that uh, what I love and what I do um, is I'm very, very interested in, um, in the encounters between human beings and divinity. You know, I'm interested in that personally. I'm interested in it, as, I'm interested in it as a scholar and as a writer. I'm interested in it as a teacher. Um, and I'm interested in the different languages and different images that people have come up with throughout the ages to speak of that encounter that many times is so is so transformative. Um, it interests me in all religions. I'm I'm very very interested in this question in Hinduism, in Islamic mysticism, uh, in Christian in Christian mysticism, maybe to a lesser extent of uh, in, intense uh, delving into it. Um, but being a participant in the, in the Jewish in the Jewish religion, yeah, I see myself as a part an active living part, uh, taking part in that um, in, in Judaism. I'm very, very interested in um, kind of reading slowly and carefully and with a lot of place for astonishment and surprise, reading into texts that leave uh, kind of imprints and uh, a regime or kind of residual affect of these encounters. And, um, and I think this kind of connects to the question of, uh, of, of psychedelics because not so much from the point of view of asking what exactly are the substances that these people might've been taking, but actually being very interested in what are the states of expanded consciousness that they are reporting about, right? Um, that is a fascinating aspect. I think later when we'll be speaking about um, kind of where do we find it within, within, within Jewish history, Jewish intellectual history or, or literary history, we'll you know, I'll go into, into, into specifics, which are, which are very interesting for me. Um, I just want to say that as um, um, beginning comments, my main field of research and, and great love is, uh, is the Zohar. And the Zohar is, uh, you know, the masterpiece of uh, Jewish um, uh, mysticism of the Middle Ages. And, and it's a fascinating world. You know, you can, uh, um, you can spend a few lifetimes in it, and I've been spending quite a few decades uh, kind of living there or learning how to go in and out of that world. But it is, it is also the crown of kind of imaginal, I mean, book of kind of um, mystical imagination that leaves us with the rest of uh, Kabbalistic literature with a great, great gift. I feel really that that's the gift with the gift of teaching us or transmitting the, um, the experienced uh, notion that reality is multi-layered, okay? that reality has many layers. And the one that we, you know, what you see is what you get is just the, 
you know, the, the, the literal, the, the, first, the first level. And that actually part of our um, role and our capacity as human beings is to learn how to actually kind of come into contact with those, with those uh, different layers. And, and therefore, I think the question of uh, transitioning into altered states and uh, looking at the different languages that come out of those states is something very fascinating that uh, that this literature that this literature teaches, and um, and I think that has to do with what we're discussing here. Like, what helps what helps us move from our daily kind of uh, regular whatever normal state of consciousness of the everyday. Into uh, into special kind of uh, dimensions or zones where uh, we can enter and exit with the riches that that may bring to us, and uh, everything else that we'll be talking about here um, seems to me to be fascinating. So I'm waiting for us to uh, jump into everything. I do want to say that the question of the intersection of psychedelics and and uh, and my, and the and my scholarships is partially what i just said you know that's where it intersects i think another aspect where it comes into into live uh discussion is uh having classrooms today where students come with their experiences that they've had uh using different kinds of um um, psychoactive stuff, you know, Israel has a lot of it, and uh, and and kind of being very attentive to the languages they're bringing back, to where are they connecting it to their Jewish experience, to their Jewish language, to Hebrew. Um, I think those things are very, very fascinating, also from the point of view of what does it mean about the classroom, what does it mean about research, et cetera. So I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. And Jay, my friend, it's yours. Thanks, Malila. Um, this is really fun. We were saying before we started that this is how we get to hang out on our different uh, different ends of North America and also different continents. Um, so, and thank you to everybody who uh, Sam already thanked at the beginning. I'm glad he remembered uh, everybody since I'm terrible at that. I wanna say one sort of prefatory thing and then make kind of one point uh, and uh, and then have a little transition to our conversation because I think that'll be really fun. You know, from my perspective, again, as a scholar of religion and religious studies, less from a historical matter, um, I'm interested in the kind of phenomenology of, of religious and mystical and psychedelic experience. And for me, I think the question of experience is the general question underlying the question of whether psychedelics are theologically significant. So there's no question anyone who's had any experience with psychedelics knows they create experiences. And the experiences are interesting for some of us, although clearly not all of us, they do often have a religious or a mystical tone. And they frequently have a tone or a sensation in the experience that it has the quality of being true. Right. So the question then has to be, well, what's the value of that experience? And I think this is a much larger question than around psychedelics. Arguably in American Christianity, for example, there's a huge split really between and between those who privilege certain kinds of, I would say, mystical experiences. So I'm thinking of charismatics, many evangelicals and so forth, and those who are more skeptical of those experiences, which would be mainline Catholics, mainline Protestants and so forth. That's certainly true in the Jewish context as well, where in certainly in large swaths of the Orthodox Jewish community, there's an active suspicion of experience. And there are plenty of Jewish texts and resources for that. I'm thinking of Nadav and Avihu. There are plenty of examples or the four uh, who go into Pardes, only one of whom really makes it back okay. There are plenty of resources for not just epistemological skepticism within the Jewish tradition, but actual hostility to experience being a ground of theology or of truth seeking. So that skepticism is in tension with the sense of the psychedelic experience that it is revelatory that it's revealing not just a pleasant experience, which or unpleasant experience for that matter, but something that's profoundly true, that may be true about the self and the body-mind system, or that may even be true about reality or God, if that's an active 
concept. My hunch, and this is pure speculation, is that I think those traditions and spiritualities which privilege experience seem to be on the ascendance right now in the in the sort of post postmodern West. Uh, as other ties around religion, so family and the Jewish tradition, let's say Holocaust, belief systems, and so forth, as those ties loosen, it seems to be a general phenomenon that religious systems that and spirituality in particular, which separates entirely one, you know, or could overlap, but which conceptually separates from sort of gnomic religion, those systems which have more experience seem to be on the ascendant. So that would suggest uh, that together with the more mainstreaming of psychedelics, that would suggest that whatever this impact or relevance of experience is on theology or worldview may increase uh, as experience-centric forms of spirituality uh, increase. So clearly, I think that that to me is the underlying question. That's that sort of um, that sort of baseline. For me, as I think it's just a matter of temperament. I could disguise it in terms of you know scholarly commitments or philosophical commitments, but I think my own. I'm, I sort of joke that I want to have as many peak experiences as possible and then doubt all of them. Uh, which uh, Rabbi David Ingber, who's a friend of many of us, I think on, on this call, couldn't believe when I told him that 20 years ago, he said, you, you doubt your own peak experiences? And I said, yes, all the time. Um, that could be about pluralism and compassion and avoiding domination or fundamentalism, or it could just could be how I'm wired. But there is always for me, not just the scholarly skepticism, which Malila and Sam, I think you, you both voiced really clearly, but even a personal, um, if not quite skepticism, then hesitancy, anava, humility, uh, which Malila mentioned, uh, that accompanies these profound experiences, partly because we've seen the role that fundamentalism can play uh, in making life miserable. And I, th I tend to validate the experiences of a extreme conservative religious fundamentalist having a spiritual experience. Certainly as a scholar, it's not my place to audit those. So I see that there can be a causal relationship, not just between psychedelics and awesome, you know, pluralistic, lovely experiences, but also between mystical experience and violence or domination um, and authoritarianism. And so there's a lot of um, a lot of humility, to put it mildly, maybe even some fear around the way that we can privilege experience theologically. So, second point that I want to make, the second of three, is it's clear that there is a or there are multiple god slash goddess experiences that are possible through psychedelics. There are also already multiple god and goddess experiences within the sweep of Jewish history and Jewish tradition. The warrior god who fights on the side of, of the Israelites, the womb god, the compassionate one, the judging god, the force for ethics or the force for good in the world, the mystical god with whom one can unite or approach or be in proximity to or yearn for, the personal God who kind of looks out for us, uh, the goddess in, in imminent in nature, the philosophical God. All of these are, these are all hechshered. All of these had to one degree or another, I guess. All of these have precedent uh, within Jewish history. So there's already a plurality of, of theologies and God images. And of course, I'd go well beyond that to include everything, Christ, Buddha, anything, and many experiences as well as conceptions. It seems as though the psychedelic experience tends more toward some of those experiences than others. It seems that it tends more toward, you know, what the, some sages call satchit ananda, being consciousness bliss. It seems to incline toward the unitive or perhaps toward the non-dual. It seems to reveal something about a primordial oneness uh, that comes with an aura of compassion around it. And yet, as I as I wrote gosh, almost 15 years ago at this point, there are some medicines which lead to other experiences. So uh, ayahuasca and other visionary medicines can actually lead more toward a radical polytheism or encounters with uh, figures which might be seen as angels or demonic. Um, it might be a polytheism with a monism behind it, as in some, for example, some, uh, some Hindu philosophies, but it might just also be a kind of polytheism or animism or uh, nature mysticism. And I think there's been a tendency, as I wrote in that article 15 years ago, because of the, as Sam said, the psychedelics that played a particular role in the Renaissance and Jewish spirituality in the 1960s and 70s, right, tended to be either psilocybin, LSD experiences that led to more on the unitive side and less of the visionary multiplicitous side. There tended to be an assumption almost, I don't know if it's quite, I don't want to put it down by saying an assumption, but there tended to be a conception that psychedelics means 
unity. And so, I mean, I wrote a book about non-dual theology, like I'm I, obviously inspiring for me, but it there it is possible that even within psychedelics, there could be a plurality of theological experiences and thus conclusions. At the very least, I'm definitely on the team that does not want to say that the God of my experience is the God of every voice that's in the scriptures. Um, there are clearly multiple deities already there. You know, there's that, uh, that uh, saying that if the only tool you have is a hammer, that everything looks like a nail, right? I think we want multiple tools, not only the tool of our own one experience when looking at the diversity of, of, uh, of Jewish texts and traditions. I think both of you already kind of mentioned that. And it's a radical unknowingness. Um, I don't know if this powerful experience that I've had many times is also what, let's say, Christian mystics write about. Um, it seems very different from what some contemporary Pentecostals might experience when they're speaking in tongues or charismatics, but I don't know. I don't know what they feel like in their trances uh, or their mystical experiences for that matter. It might be project different projections of my minds and theirs into imagination. It might be any sort of way of conceptualizing that which is difficult to conceptualize. Uh, as Sam said, the text creates the interpretation, the their text affects the interpretation, the interpretation then affects the text, affects the theology. So my mystical experience may or may not be somebody else's uh, mystical experience, and it may be somebody else's simple pleasure or experience of the drug as a drug, not as some, some uh, numinous uh, encounter with something ineffable or transpersonal. Last thing I wanna say, uh, the third point is, you know, looking at our interests in the question, obviously there are scholarly interests. There are also kind of spiritual contemporary Jewish interests. It's possible to be interested in this intersection because psychedelic experience can make Jewish experience deeper and richer. My tendency is actually the opposite. <laughs> I'm interested in how my Jewish uh, cultural and religious lamination and, and background makes the psychedelic experience deeper. Uh, so Sam recently gave a presentation on a, an astonishing document by Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi, a founder of Jewish Renewal, talking about a psychedelic experience and how important it was for him to have kind of Jewish stuff with him, not just uh, physical stuff, although that too, you know, like Talos and Phil and things like that, but also that conceptual uh, frame and all of the symbols that were part of it. I love having Jewish stuff around in my medicine experiences. It seems, it, it feels both comforting, but also deepening. Uh, connecting me to home and folkways, roots, connections to ancestors. I'm definitely not making any claim about theology or God, Torah, and Israel, but there just feels as there's a there's a deepening that takes place that I think is really valuable. And certainly, as Malila just alluded to and, and could explore in great detail, since I've, I've read you on it many times, uh, there's plenty of evidence of some altered states that are related to prophecy. Um, maybe not with these tools, uh, but ecstasies, prophetic experiences, group prophetic experiences, as in the Zohar, or at least altered experiences, some kind of transpersonal experience, Abu Lafia, Ezekiel, Hasidism, Neo Hasidism. It's also, I, I have a sort of open minded question as to the relationship of substances to those experiences or got outbreaks. You know, it's interesting that poison grain makes an appearance in some Hasidic stories. Um, but I'm certainly not looking for, you know, let's say hashkacha or validation, either of those texts or of my own experience. But certainly there is at the core level, returning to my first point, the notion that experience can be profoundly generative and revelatory uh, within multiple Jewish mystical and esoteric traditions. And so then it's almost a question only of means of what tools and what what processes, whether it's only ecstatic prayer or ecstatic meditation or something else or wine or whatever, or if also these additional tools can be, I think, Sam, you know, your metaphor, like the jump start or shock treatment uh, can also be uh, can also be employed. So that is my opening spiel. <laughs> Amazing. Wow. Well, I kind of am tempted to turn it Back to you, Malila. I'm interested. I mean, this this question that Jay raised um, about, like, really, honestly, historically speaking, like, to what extent have experiences been valued as generative of Jewish theology, as relevant as 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 revealing? I mean, didn't the rabbis of the Talmud say that the age of prophecy is over? Like, do we just abandon that? 
but your in your scholarship in, in your book on the Zohar on religion on mystical experience, religious experience in the Zohar. I'm just curious to hear you what thoughts you have on that question because I agree with you, Jay, that the question of the relationship between experiences and theological innovation in the tradition seems to be really central here to thinking about psychedelics. Mm -hmm. um, I think these are fascinating questions. Um, we do have to remember, and I think Jay, you you alluded to that in some kind of way. But we have so many theologies. Judaism doesn't have a theology, right? I mean, we don't do theology on that level. Like people try to do all kinds of systematic stuff, but there, are, you know, you can just open up the deck of God images in Judaism. It's huge, right? And like every 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 century, you have a different a different Im imagination, different language. And they somehow fit in the, you know, you can put them together in the deck, um, which I think is fascinating in itself. But when I'm thinking of, of you know, the role of experience, or I would say uh, the role of, of experience, it seems to be very important, right? That has very high importance uh, in, in ways of understanding and having language around God, I think really we have it all in the Tanakh. I mean, it's true that we're not biblical Jews, but if we look at our ground language, our ground language is that language of uh, of the Tanakh, of of, of 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 scripture, of the Bible. And and you know, when you look at Ezekiel and Isaiah and the elders, uh, kind of looking at God or uh, um, or Moses seeing the great vision right of the burning bush or i mean and these are all kind of in the hard in the you know drive of kind of jewish collective consciousness they have a big role in structuring um language around experiences of encountering of encountering the divine i'm thinking i'm thinking of moses I'm thinking of the radiance of the face. I'm thinking of, uh, you know, Daniel, right? He says, "You, I became different, right? It has altered me. The experience has altered me. All that goes into the big lexicon of languages around which, you know, what's legit, legitimate language to be speaking about encounters with God or, or, or the world, the world of divinity. So, First of all, I, I find that uh, those special, special states, those special heightened peak experiences of, of, uh, of people, and the most important one, of course, is the one that we all were part of, which is standing at Sinai, where everybody's in this, you know, totally open state of seeing voices, seeing, seeing sounds, and this synesthetic experience in an experience of being very, very close to death, right? The, the, the fear, the awe, the excitement, you know, described and transmitted year after year, not just in Torah reading, but in, in the holiday and Shavuot coming up. I mean, so, so first of all, I wanna say, it's full of that, that lends the language, right? When you try to say, how does Rashbi and the Zohar uh, experience the divine? Is it possible to experience the divine as being face to face with someone? They say, yeah, that's what it says about Moses, right? So the ground language is always there. I mean, in whatever way we play, play with it is another, is another question. But I wanted to say, I wanted to say that, uh, that's something that I find very interesting. And also I really, I really, in the way I understand it, I think at the heart of religions, you know, there's a fire. There's a fire of uh, of intense experience, and and that intense, um, you know, that intense fire is so strong. Everybody moves back. It's very it's very difficult to withstand it without like dying from overexposure. So when you look at systematic religion, systematic religion is kind of a systems of cooling down, right? Cooling down cooling down like how do you how do you put this into structure into language etc uh which on the one hand becomes a way of reaccessing those experiences 
And on the other hand, it sometimes ossifies them, right? Keeps keeps you um, keeps you keeps you back. Um, another thing that I thought would be really interesting to think about from the point of view of theologies is that when we move from from biblical ways of imagining God into the world of rabbinics. Uh, and and Jay, you said that about the story of the four who entered Pardes, you, you know, which is such an archetypal central story that tells of four four sages, four rabbinic sages that stepped into the divine world or stepped across the threshold of the regular world, and only one out of four seems to be able to kind of enter and exit in peace. Right? Nas b'shalom v'atzav b'shalom is only said about Rabbi Akiva. And that the story that one goes mad and that one dies and that one, you know, uh, uh, kind of totally leaves the fold, uh, I think is a very meaningful uh, story from the point of view of saying, you know, people, this path is a very, is a path full of dangers. It's a path full of dangers. One out of four, one out of four really come out and change religion or they change our language they change the horizon of the way we understand uh, god and the way we kind of have language to speak of divinity but it means that this is a path the path of entering intense openings of of consciousness need to be dealt with with a lot of uh attention right a lot of too much live because you know like they say in the tosefta it's a path where on one side is fire and the other side is ice. And you have to know how to navigate. It's about navigating, you know, with humility, with accuracy, with letting go of notions that what works in this reality also works in that reality. Um, so, so I think it's very powerful that in, in uh, rabbinic literature, I mean, we'll get to mystical stuff later. I don't want to talk too much, but I just want to say, that in rabbinic literature, we have these ideas that, um, how would I call it, like creative innovations and in study of Torah create by themselves expanded states, which, you know, we, we, if we retract it, Chagiga in the Talmud Yerushalmi and in the Babylonian Talmud, we have these amazing descriptions of how all of nature partakes in the experience, right? The trees start singing and clapping, fire comes down, the ring of fire is around. So, so it's, very, it's very powerful that they speak about that as people who on the one hand are sitting and creating law, creating religion, Judaism as structure, not as theologies, and on the other hand, the same people can have these outstanding experiences uh, that they bring back into, you know, into the treasure troves of the way we think in our different in our different theologies. So I'll keep uh, I'll keep the Middle Ages for for later. But I'm just saying it's so it's so uh, it's so fascinating the way that different layers have different takes um, about, about uh, paths that, um, that create these altered states and the way they relate to the way we speak about the divine. Yeah, I was really struck by that. Maybe this will be our Talmudic section and then Sam, you can rustle us over to the medieval period. But um, first I was struck, Malia, what you just said that, you know, a few people have asked already in the chat, you know, do we think that X or Y or Z figure we're using psychedelics? And for me, I'm, I'm more interested in the, what I think I, what I, what I think I heard you say a little bit about, like, there's almost this vocabulary or grammar of altered state experience that clearly is present. Absolutely. And there is not a lot, you know, Ezekiel sits down by a river. He doesn't say, and then I ate a, you know, a mushroom or something, but there he sits down by a river, gazes into the river, has a vision, right? The, uh, the four that go into, into Pardes, same way. Um, and it feels to me more, I'm more inspired by that uh, sort of general move than by which tools were used. I think there's sometimes an anxiety, like, is this tool kosher or not? You know, like even for people who aren't religious in that sense, but just like, 
is this is this okay or am I am I more Akiva or am I more Acher in uh, in using this particular medicine? I, by the way, I think I always think it's like two came out okay. Maybe Acher was fine. <laughs> you know, he's the one who left entirely. Maybe that was the right decision for him. I've always felt that was also a polemic. I always felt like this was like this is the you know the very beginning we think of the Hichalot uh, mystical speculations, and these were probably overlapping but different communities and different iterations of what. Jewishness in the post-temple period was going to look like, you know, was it going to look like mystical practice or was it going to look like the sort of normative practice or both? And I've always, I've always taken that with a grain of salt. I was curious, just to, this is a total of selfish digression, but I've wondered this question for now, 23 years. What do you think the water water is about where it's like, if you, when you enter, there's a visualization probably of the temple and there's a warning that says, when you enter the stone of polished marble, don't say water. And I remember asking my professor that in 1990 and not being satisfied with the answer. You got anything on that? I've always imagined that, that what water, water is, there's a sort of luminosity, there's some kind of vision, but don't think that it's going to drown you, right? Just like uh -huh. can continue, continue proceeding. So don't be afraid. It's a, it's a Talmudic Icaro to just like keep you, keep you going forward in the journey. Yeah. Well, there's also, I mean, another part of that Tosefta that you referred to, Malila, the, the rabbinic commentary on the four who entered the Pardes that I love and I feel like doesn't get enough playtime these days is the, the additional image of walking in the garden of the king, of the divine, and that one of the challenges there and the reason it says that Akiva was able to move uh, unscathed through the experience was that he didn't take his eyes off the king. Right, that there's this way that actually part of part of where where it gets where where we suffer more and maybe where it can break us even on some level is when we start trying to run away when we say water water and, and try to flee or when we just can't look anymore at what's happening and can't sort of surrender to the image in that way yeah i'm also i also think um i mean there's so many ways of looking at it but i also think that my i'll tumble my mind do not say Water, water also has to do with um, kind of just being with what is happening in, in such a state and not immediately defining it, because I think that's exactly, you know, one of the things that one shouldn't be doing is schlepping, you know, carrying everything that makes sense to you in one dimension into the other one and then demanding it to stand, you know, to... to to, to be of the same type and actually the ability to stand watching, you know, ripples of light and not, not conclude, not say, not, not, you know, even if it's a shatachat, even if it's a ecstatic comment, it's kind of, kind of to hold it in, I think is, is another way of maybe of looking at it, but there's so many ways we can, I'm not sure there's one answer to that. Yeah. No, that's of course. Um, so this, this has started to come up and I want to, I want to, um, kind of amplify it. And also while, while I'm amplifying things, I just want to amplify, uh, Charlie Stang's comment in the chat. We're seeing more questions, I think, come in the chat, put them in the Q and A. It'll make it a lot easier. The Q and A button to the right of the chat button will make it easier later. Um, but okay. So a question now that I want to bring here is, um, like maybe this isn't anything new at all, right? That there have been various techniques throughout Jewish history of altering consciousness. Uh, we could point to, I mean, we talked about Ezekiel at the river that um, the Merkava mystics apparently had some practice of gazing into the surface of water, which if you've tried it is quite, uh, can be quite a mind altering experience and that that's what it meant for him to be at the river. And these, and different techniques, especially ones that like are borrowed from other cultures, appropriated, borrowed, um, different techniques of prayer used that were in, that were in Jewish circles in 13th century Egypt, inspired by encounters with Sufi prayer practices. Um, uh, we can look at Abu Lafia and different practices of contemplation and meditation that were um, that he was borrowing from other sort of cultural contexts that were altering um, consciousness in very profound ways. I think like even the 1990s of the sort of Jewish mindfulness, uh, you know, tidal wave that was 
um, experimenting with practices that were um, in, in many ways new to, to Jewish communities and were indeed like changing the ways that people thought about divinity, the ways that people were reading sources. And like, is this just another one of those? Or or is or does or does psychedelic does ingestion of psychedelic substances is is that something different? Is it just more of the same, or do you see this as actually some sort of qualitative shift? All right. Well, Malila, since you kept yourself muted, I'll thank you. Um, you yeah, okay, would you like to start? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love that question. And obviously, I have no answer to it. I, in a certain way, everything is qualitatively so different. I mean, look, what are we doing right now, right? We're like talking about hidden wisdom that was forbidden to talk about, you know, after the Frankest episode, of course, by the way, I have to, I have to do some self promotion. Uh, and we're talking about it on this, these devices, which are completely miraculous, which would, I have no idea, you know, like Arthur Clark said, this, this te technology would look like magic. Um, so, you know, we're doing it in a way that's a little bit more, you know, gender inclusive and other inclusive than any Jewish tradition ever was for, you know, 96% of the Jewish, the sweep of the Jewish history. So I don't know if, the, if it may be qualitatively different, but it feels like everything is qualitatively different. So I almost don't see it as anomalous um, in, in that regard. I mean, if we can say Kaddish on Zoom during a global pandemic, you know, that, that feels like the paradigm has shifted in a certain way. I don't mean to be glib about it, but I, it it does feel to me as though the 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 pace of change this this seems to be in keeping with the current pace of change. Such that, again, that's why I go back to again some of the questions in the chat. You know, like the Nadav and Avihu episode, which does seem to reference you know whether it's strange fire or whether it's incense and whether that. Like, I don't know, I, I, to me, it's less central as to whether that's the same medicines that, you know, that I might know. And that is in my, my short stories actually have a lot of that that's coming out in December, but, but as a scholarly matter, I have no idea, but I am profoundly interested in the notion that there's some kind of spiritual practice that can then lead to this rupture. Uh, and here are some tools for staying secure or safe on the, uh, on the way. On the derech, I'm very interested in the kind of, you know, this is this is a little glib, but you know, the Zoharic circle that Malila has written so much about, maybe is the Shefa psychedelic integration circle of you know the 13th and 14th century, that this was a group practice, right? That this was not, and you know, these these mystics are dying with a kiss, right? They're just they're, they're it's not it's yeah. not they're not playing around, and there seems to be so those like that general understanding of depths of reality that are somehow accessible in different ways that have perils and that also have those rewards. And here are some community, here's do this with community, do this with tools. Um, that feels to me enduring and central. Hmm. Hey, Ophi. Hey, Ophi. Uh, I wanted to add um, to Sam to your question, you know, is this something new? Is it different? Um, that there's a beautiful story in the Zohar, which, uh, which I think speaks to this question. There's a story, it's a very long story. And, uh, and at the end of which all the Fevraya, all the, the, the disciples of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, they come to, to Tveria, to the house of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And Rabbi Shimon noticed that there's one of them who hasn't talked all day. He says, Rabbi Yossi, you know, I see you haven't talked. Can you, okay, you start lighting up the night. And he opens and, and quotes the Song of Songs saying, Isha, can, kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. Yeah, for your, uh, uh, for your love uh, is more intoxicating. Tuvim comes from Tuvim, intoxication than wine. And then Rabbi Yossi in commenting, you know, doing his kind of Zoharic riff on it says, yeah, you know, guys, what is it that we're so, what is this wine that we are so intoxicated by? And he says, it's God. So when you read it, he says, it's God. And that's why we're, we're so when I read that, I say to myself, these people, they had their techniques of you know, going in, you know, going into that zone. And not only that, they had techniques which would allow what Jay, what Jay, what you were talking about, 
things that would allow that rupture, like, and also that, you know, that, that the, the, the faith that working through the study, the engagement, the love of Torah, if you do it in certain ways, things are going to open up. And, and, you know, the, it's not about ingesting stuff. It's a, it's a different mode. You know, it's staying awake at night. It's doing all, I mean, they, they have ways of doing it. I think what is very fascinating about, I mean, now we're taking this new wave of interest in psychedelics, but I think the the very formative uh, essay that Art Green wrote when he was a young student in Brandeis, um, and he was 21, I think those questions are still very, very important, is that because our experience is of such sudden, you know, unmediated experience with what we experience as the divine, you know, the gods or the goddesses or the winged powers um, or the intelligence, uh, that the question that he asks there is like, if you can, if you can just go there and just like that, you know, kind of cut through all the veils, then like, why, 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 why sit and work for years on, on, on these texts and try to decipher? Now, that was the first, that's arts, like, like, wow, moments, like, what do we do now with Jewish theology? But I think that when he returns to it, it's something that's still relevant to us. What do you think? You know, when he returns and kind of reflects on it and says, well, you know, there's experience, but actually to learn the pathways is a very important thing. You know, it's like in Degel Machane Prime, in the Hasidic, in the commentary about Shavuot that, that's coming up soon, where he says, you know, Maybe it's good that everybody backed off and said, we can't handle the fight. You know, we can't handle this. It's too intense uh, because experience is something that you're in. And then the, and then it's, and then it's not there. And the question is, can, can one learn the path that actually allows you to, to learn the way, you know, in a slow, gradual way and not just be blasted into mocking the gutlut but actually know how to make the move of growing, of growing into this. So I don't know. I just think these are such, it's fascinating questions. So, so yes, it does have a qualitative difference that, you know, all you have to do is take something in, make a blessing, take it in and, and go wherever they're going to take you. Um, but actually, does that have any theological significance? Is that theologically significant? That's, you know, Mapitom, I would say people have amazing experiences. Some of their experience might impact the way they experience the divine, for sure. But I think to say theologically meaningful is actually when people that have gone into, you know, Ail Venafik, that they went in, and have incredible experiences, have the capacity of emerging, you know, from that uh, experience of uh, of that encounter and being able to say something about it that connects it in some kind of way, either through language, through holidays, through ideas that we have in Torah, through ideas that we have in different theologies, that can connect it to that. Then we can talk about something that's meaningful beyond the idiosyncratic, amazing meaningfulness that it might have for me. I think that's when, you know, that's when you feel that it's impacting actually about the way we can start thinking about it in a way that we can also transmit it and speak about it. And that's something amazing. You know, Erich Neumann, when he says in Mystical Man, he says, that's you know the midlife mystical experience that is really of of great worth is being able to kind of dip into the nominus but also come out and say something about it you know turn it into something that 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 actually makes sense in some kind of way or is coherent with the culture so i, I mean, wanted to I, 
I think I want to like slightly push back on the mapitom. Why would this be theologically? So, so I totally agree, right? And and also you did a perfect transition to now talk about the 19th, 20th, and 21st <laughs> century. So Sam is really happy because we've now moved on to the next era and the one he studies. But uh, right, because I mean, I I think the I think the early Hasidim definitely thought that these experiences were theologically significant. Um, you know, whether it's like Rev Aaron of Star Celia or, 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 yeah. or Mittler Rebbe or, you know, any of the ones who are, and Rebbe Nachman, for them in a very, Rebbe Nachman, a very different mode, but still, you know, that these were generative uh, and also truth revealing. And even back to the Pardes, like the fact that Acher could have an experience and then leave Judaism, you know, that to me is theologically significant, that there was something that was seen. I mean, again, the, you know, the Talmud has other reasons why he left, but it just if we just isolate that experience. So, and and I think, you know, just speaking personally, like the, the, these experiences, which now for me, it's it's been 24 years that I've been having these experiences, you know, with some regularity and some with medicine and some on meditation retreat and some on, and, you know, there are some in other practices, uh, earth-based practices. I'll be at a Beltane thing in four days or whatever it is. So, you know, there, there are different modalities and ways in, but that has shifted my own personal theology many, many times. And it just doesn't feel, you know, at, not as a scholar, but as a practitioner, you know, when something just doesn't feel aligned with compassion, this sounds very sanctimonious, I apologize. But like, when it doesn't feel that way, like it feel that just feels theologically rotten to me like as like rotten food like it just feels like slightly repulsive like if it's some something that's leading to more cruelty and maybe that's because I'm such a wonderfully advanced human being but I doubt it I think it's more that there just have been numerous experiences where the aspect of compassion or love that comes along with that it's not that that is integratable it's not just the like you know, I was dealing with my cleaning up after my kid, and then I had a mystical experience, and now I'm back cleaning after my kid. No, I mean, the cleaning up is connected to me for the values and the, the sensations that emerge from that peak experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're getting into deep territory here with, I mean, thinking about the the preparation for the experience, we could say, or what occasions the experience, Malila, what you were speaking about, about the 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 contrast that Art Green drew in this 1968 uh, 1969 uh, article on LSD and Kabbalah and what does it mean to um and and are those pathways up the mountain uh, that are slower and more deliberate perhaps um, at least more cultivated like to what extent are those pathways so overgrown now um, from neglect and from lack of foot traffic and, <laughs> um that uh right this this discourse that has come up a couple times about um you know Moses must have been tripping Ezekiel must have been tripping that on some level like that is a that's a modern discourse worthy of research in its own right that's a weird distinctively <laughs> modern contemporary um imagination uh and it, and I think it involves a sort of amnesia Right, that there's a forgetting of these ancestral techniques and technologies that did not necessarily involve ingesting um, a psychedelic substance that have been so forgotten that one can only imagine now that they must have been tripping. Um, and also this question of whether the communal interpersonal integration process is a necessary ingredient of these experiences being theologically meaningful, or as Jay, you're putting, um, whether even experiences that are indeed like quite limited to a particular individual um, on their own personal path as a Jewish person, or as uh, in the case of Acher, a, a formerly Jewish person, right? Like whether these are nonetheless theologically significant in their own right. Um, I wanna in a moment, uh, we should probably just open this up to Q and A now. We're we're uh, we we're got some seven good minutes. Cues. I'm reading. Yeah, the we've cues. got some I've been good trying cues, to respond so... to a couple of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to invite back in to help us sift through some of these questions. Right. There. Yeah, there is a a, ve a lot of questions, and um, many of them are being put in the chat. So we have to go to two different places to sort through them all. Um, I'm going to. 
I'm going to ask a question of you all. First of all, thank you. This has been very rich um, to, to listen to. I want to ask you a question that gets behind a lot of the questions that I'm seeing. And to some degree, you've already anticipated it, which is not answering the historical questions of was Ezekiel tripping or is there a psychedelic embedded in this or that biblical story, but the 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 um the implicit question behind those, which is, what are we after? What's at stake in asking about historical precedents of psychedelics in Judaism? Why are why why are Jews or others interested in that his, question of historical precedents? And if you'll permit me, I just want to, um, you know, uh, this is a, obviously a burning question, also in uh, Christianity and psychedelics. So the last year, two years ago, we had Brian Marescu in this series and his book, The Immortality Key, which was exploring evidence for psychedelic use in the ancient Mediterranean. And, and more specifically, it's really drilling into the evidence for psychedelics um, in the Eleusinian mysteries and then early Christianity. Um, there, in both cases, you of course have a, a ritual around um, uh, a, a drink, the kikion in the case of the Eleusinian mysteries, and of course the Eucharist, the wine um, in, um, in Christianity. Very briefly, and in my very humble opinion, I've read the book now quite closely um, twice, uh, the evidence for the Eleusinian side is still indirect, but seems uh, encouraging. Like I think it's very plausible that the Kikion had, was psychoactive. I don't think there's any good evidence yet for the, the, the Eucharist. And frankly, I don't think there will be evidence that could, I don't think there will be evidence. I think there will be more evidence to come to light on the Eleusinian, but I'm trying to get at why are we so interested in this question? And um, so I'm gonna ask it of you all with respect to Judaism, but the same question would be posed to Christians. My suspicion is that it goes back to Sam's opening remarks that there are a lot of contemporary Jews who feel as if the tradition has suppressed experience as a significant component. And many contemporary Jews who are having these pretty uh, um, powerful experiences occasioned by psychedelics or perhaps by other modalities. And they want to know then how they can hold those experiences. And I feel like there's like, there's a, um, it, 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 one way to make these experiences licit is to find them in the historical record, right? That must be, but is that, is it just that? Or is there more to looking for precedent? Why should we care about the ancient? I mean, I think another possibility is that this is lurking around Brian's work as well. There is a, a hypothesis, which I, very much disagree with that somehow psychedelics are the explain the birth of religion. I mean, that's kind of the stoned ape hypothesis um, crossed with the study of religion. And I feel like some people are, are, are sort of advocating that too, like, oh, well, it's not just that my psychedelic experience, I want to find historical precedent in my tradition to make it listed and maybe even in, in, in deepen my engagement with my tradition, but maybe I'm actually back at the very origins of what religion is. And I'm tripping with Ezekiel means, you know, he and I are, um, we're really at the start of this thing. And I would love to hear your reflections on, on that meta question of why we, why people seem to care so much about the ancient. I can, I can take the first bite at that. I mean, I think sometimes it's validating the experience and sometimes it's validating the tradition. Yep. Like is Judaism yeah. worth it? Well, it's worth it if it's grounded in this awesome experience. Because, <laughs> you know, I definitely, I don't, this is me in some voice. Like, I don't believe in the old man in the sky. I don't believe in the creation myth, but I do believe in the psychedelic experience. And so if that's the root of Judaism, then Judaism has some value. I think that's one, one version of it. And I think that's also true. You know, then there's also, there's, there's the, the flip, which is the, the legitimizing of the experience. Like, I've had this powerful experience. I want it. That's why I joked about it being kosher. Like, I want this to be like aligned in some way. Mm -hmm. um, I want this to, and again, we've seen in the Jewish tradition, there are mystical experiences that lead you off the derech, meaning off the path. And so I think it's a, at least it's a, it's a concern with historical precedent. 
uh, to see, you know, is this, is this leading me astray? Is this, you know, is, is, is this demonic? Is this like a Vodazara? Is this foreign worship? Is this idolatry or is it, is it cool? And I think uh, to me, that goes to some of the core psychology of religion, you know, around what's okay and what's not okay. Am I okay? Am I not okay? Guilt and all, and all of the, you know, the whole, that whole package. And I, I am interested for the folks who have asked that question in the chat, in holding it light in a non-judgmental way, mm -hmm. but inquiring mm -hmm. as to like what my intention is or what's at stake, the way you put it, Charles, what's at stake in this question? Not as an accusatory thing, like don't ask that question, but it's a very, we see it a lot. And there was a whole, the Shafa, there's a psychedelic Judaism Facebook group back when we all used to use Facebook. And uh, this was like a big, long thing. And there were people with very strong opinions that cannabis is in the Torah and it's not where it isn't or this or that. And yeah, in a non-accusatory, non-judgmental way, I think your question is one I want to pose in response. It's a very Jewish mm -hmm. thing. You're supposed to be Christian theology. You answered a question with a question, but uh, that's like the Jews are supposed to do that. Uh, you know, I think answering that question with a question is is profoundly right. Like, that's fine as a question. And what's at stake? And that to me invites a kind of discernment around how we value experience and and or tradition and that for me feels like what's it, it but I, I get it though. I, I, I don't wanna sound dismissive of that question because these can be profoundly unsettling experiences. I mean, certainly my first ayahuasca experience, which I never write about ever and only talk about it. This is the first Zoom recorded thing I've ever talked about it was deeply uh, heretical. You know, I spent a while with Ganesh. I spent a while with Ayahuasca herself, with Ayaruna, who seemed like I asked her if she was Lilith and she sort of laughed at me and said how ridiculous that question was, that she didn't anything need anything from me. I needed stuff from her. Shut up. That's what Lilith, that's what, you, that's what your men said about me. <laughs> that's not me. And I thought that was a great response from her. And just the idea that there, that the reality of this other entity, and she wasn't the only one, met multiple other entities was very still uh, 20 years later from that first experience um, uh, something like that is still um it's an open question for me and it's definitely an open theological question um mm -hmm. and yeah i'll leave it at that I, I can say more i'll leave it at that yeah also just want to note that um you know these these questions of history are i think even more deeply questions of jewish memory and that this is what Jews and the, and people of all religious traditions, I think, but I'll just speak about the Jewish context, have always done, right? The rabbis of the Talmud were deeply engaged with their own liturgies, practices of prayer, laying to fill in, and imagined the patriarchs of Genesis uh, as davening the morning, afternoon, and evening prayers like they did. They imagined that Abraham couldn't possibly have served milk and meat to the angels, um, and and Abraham kept kosher. Maimonides imagined Moses as a philosopher, right? And so people have contemporary folks having profound psychedelic experiences are are they're refracting Torah through that prism, and mm -hmm. that's a question that comes out as historical discourse, and those are interesting questions. But I think even more deeply it's a it's a question of jewish cultural memory hmm. i think i'd like to add to that i mean i totally i totally agree with everything that was said by both of you but i want to add maybe that um we care about these questions also um because when we find um kind of uh Footprints, imprints, soulscapes that are describing these things in, in classical and ancient uh, texts that belong to one's culture. It's that sense that these are the wells that the ancestors dug. You know, it's something so, I mean, it's a Hasidic take on it, but it's like the feeling that some other people had the feeling that there is a veil over our eyes and there are ways that we could, you know, Gali and I, we can open, we can unveil that and we can see different, you know, we can see reality in a different perspective. Um, but the, the notion that somebody already opened up, somebody already opened up the will. Like, so, so we're, we're in that 
business. You know, we're looking for ways of connecting to the different worlds that have been open. I think that's another reason that we're looking for that. Like, uh... um, okay, I will, there's a question I'd like to pose, but it seems an odd one to pose at the end because in some sense, I feel like we should have posed it much more explicitly at the beginning. Sam, we, we like odd here, this is good. <laughs> okay, cyclical. Sam, you spoke, you, you addressed this question to some degree and, and maybe um, Jay and Malila, you did too, but I missed it, but which is just, can we reflect briefly on what are the criteria by which we assess something as theologically significant within Judaism? First of all, the category of theology is not native to Judaism and, and nor is it to Islam. That's a, that's a, that's a category that has a kind of contested, um, uh, uh, legacy, I, so I understand in Judaism. So, so that in and of itself is interesting. And then significance, what does it mean for something to be theologically significant? Uh, Sam, you spoke about that in terms of whether and how these experiences um, occasion a kind of return to the tradition. Uh, if I, if I'm mis is that unfair? Um, well, maybe we somehow you stimulate that interplay between experiences and yeah. traditional engagement with the tradition yeah okay so i felt like that was that was one way of getting at theological significance is there a kind of robust energetic dynamic dialectic between experience and tradition that these uh, that these that these medicines or psychedelics can occasion um if you want to add to that sam or malila or jay if you want to just say a word about that framework for theological significance i think you're muted malila I, I think, Jay, that you said it very beautifully, like it would be, you know, when you said, look, it's, it can be, first of all, about uh, theological significance for the person who's having the experience, right? You're saying you want to, you don't want to say that that's not, it, that that's insignificant theologically. I totally agree with that mm -hmm. on a personal level. I'm just saying that I think when we're talking about for Judaism, there's it's just looking at it from different circles from the point of view not of significance of significance from the point of view that it actually you know the finish that you come up with from an experience uh gets worked through into the into the into the river of uh, the way different jews are thinking about something i think from that point i from that point of view i'm talking about significance from the point of view of transmission, that it turns into something that not really, that isn't just the way it impacts on the way I say, you know, what happens to me when I think about ancestors, when I say that blessing, God who remembers the, the good acts of my ancestors, you know, that I, something changed in the way that I see that. But the question is, who can take that and and turn it into language that that you can, that I can teach in class that we can work with that you write in your in your in your parshat shavua dvar Torah that you write in your next book I think I think that's that's it's just a question of the order in which in in which we're doing it and, and it's not that it's less significant on a personal level it's just when does it when does it impact on a, on a on, in a more collective in a more collective way? I think that's what I'm asking because I think that it's true. Judaism doesn't demand like you know it's not an orthodox religion, so you don't have a doxa about how you're supposed to understand God. You can be in synagogue with people that have a totally different take on a totally different theology, and we can stand together. So. I just wanted to add that, but I totally agree with you, Jay, on, on, on the meaningfulness on the personal level. That, that, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think I feel like that process of osmosis feels almost inevitable. You know, whether it's if it's a formal theologian, or Franz Rosenzweig or Martin Buber or something, you know, Buber, at, sorry, I shouldn't say anything about Buber in Sam's presence because he's a Buber expert, but, you know, <laughs> he had certain experiences that that led him to one philosophical outlook, and then he had other spiritual experiences that led him to reject that outlook that the one he rejected is more consonant with common let's say new age psychedelia by the way right to reject that and and that was very impactful and i think you know going down the line from abstruse philosopher to mystic to legend maker to poet to artist to you know everybody 
that feels so I guess I'd, I, I, yeah, I don't, it feels like if it's going to be theologically significant to Jews, it's going to be theological significant to Judaism sooner or later. Mm-hmm. Or feminist theology is this way, queer theology is this way, uh, indigenous minded theology, theologies of racial justice, right? All of these trickle out in ways that um, sometimes are top down, but more often are just, yeah, osmosis. Mm-hmm. I want to highlight another. Th- Thank you all for that. Um, and uh, I mean, it was curious, Jay, you sort of moved that question from not answering about theological significance for Judaism, but the distinction between the- what's theologically significant for Jews versus what's theologically significant for Judaism, and suggesting that there's a there's a um, that one leads to the other. But I think uh, that's because can, of what Malila can, said, right? There's not you know, there's not like the authority, there's not the catechism, there's not the, you know, and so, you know, it's, it's always funny when I teach kids this, actually, it's really fun, like to get that through, like, what does Judaism say about X or Y or Z? It's like, well, you know, who's asking, right? Like, which, which, which authority we can, so that's why I think the osmosis process is particularly relevant here, it, because there's not like an appeals process in a Supreme Court, you know, I, I think that though in this framework, Christianity often serves as a foil to this understanding. Is it's right. the, yeah. the the fact of the matter is that what you've just described is absolutely obtains right. in every of actual course. historical yeah. instantiation of Christianity. Right. There of is course. no yeah. uh, top-down dictate that that somehow governs what people experience and believe. Um, but I want to highlight something else you said early on, Jay, which really struck me and resonated, which is this question about doubting one's own experience. Because one of the things I think that I've experienced in the in the psychedelic um, renaissance as it crosses paths with uh, religion is, uh, well, first of all, there's what I've called psychedelic evangelism, people who have had psychedelic experience, experience who feel like everybody needs to do this, right? Like, it's like the Apostle Paul tripped and everybody needs to be tripping. But then the other is a psychedelic literalism and even fundamentalism. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, a, 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 that is to say, if I've had an experience, that experience, I can kind of, I can take that experience almost literally as literally true. And I can hold to it um, as if it were bedrock. And I think, I just want to highlight that I took your point to be, um, there's no reason to think that your experience somehow, or a singular experience, should not be put through the fire of discernment, um, uh, maybe relative to other experiences you've had, but equally other experiences that other people have had. And I think this is what's, this is one of the benefits of having, uh, the benefits of communities, what I call communities of discernment, um, when you're talking about experiences of this scale, transcendent or transformative experiences, is that if you have a community of discernment that can help you sift through these experiences and understand how to weigh them and make meaning out of them. I mean, the, the again, I'll pivot to something I know in the Christian tradition, people are having all sorts of wild experiences, sometimes of Christ, sometimes of angels, sometimes of demons in monastic communities. Those are not taken at face value. In fact, very often, if you have a experience of the divine that gets Put through a pretty significant ringer of skepticism because in that worldview, the demons are precisely trying to make you think that you're having experiences of Christ to lead you down a particular path. Um, so I, I'm wondering if you're seeing in your various constituencies, communities, people who are working with these medicines, do you see that kind of commitment to disciplined discernment? I mean, I see the 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 sort of uh, the rigor that you just mentioned in Orthodox communities all the time. Even if we go back to the '60s and '70s, where there was discussion about Judaism and meditation, Judaism and psychedelics, etc., and there was overwhelming rejection from what I would call traditional Orthodox uh, authorities. Um, I haven't seen it as much. I'm interested with the rise of conspirituality. Right, which I think panelists know about, but maybe not everyone listening. You know, the the sort of convergence of what we might call usually progressive left wing spirituality with conspiracy theorizing and stuff like that in a, in a lot of different forms. You know that that I've seen subjectively. This is purely anecdotal 
valueless. <laughs> uh, an increased an increased uh, interest in discernment among what I would call progressively minded spiritual practitioners, because mm -hmm. we've just seen so many people, including beloved people, really go off the rails. Uh, and so, you know, we haven't, I mean, I guess we could, you could go back to past examples like the Manson family or something like that, but we haven't, I don't think we've seen recently this kind of ordinarily, uh, things we used to think would always like, if everyone do yoga and everyone would meditate, we would just definitely get to world peace and we'd be fine. And, and it's going to naturally lead to that. And just, we've seen in the last five years that it frequently does not and leads to its opposite. I mean, Milila, maybe there's more experience with this in, in Israel. I remember when I was living in Israel and I, I met, you know, hard right-wing nationalist hippies for the first time. And I, I could, I'd never encountered that, right? People who are like authentically like pot smoking hippies, like in the hills of the, of the West Bank with like extreme nationalistic views. Mm. And so I, I don't see a lot of what you're asking, but I, I'm wondering if we're going to see more because of these kinds of unusual juxtapositions that we haven't seen in most of the last 50 years. Sam, I'd love to hear you. What, what, what do you think? Yeah, well, I want to hear you too. But I mean, what's what's? I think we do need more people like studying these, studying this in the contemporary world. Like Madison Margolin is a journalist who I think is doing a lot of interesting work on sort of contemporary spheres. But there's very little. But from the part of the elephant that I'm investigating and what I see and experience. My sense is that actually Jewish psychedelic engagement seems to be helping to re-elasticize Jewish theology in some way, that actually it's, it's a lot of people are interested in it precisely because these experiences sort of break out of literalist, narrow, sort of frozen um, conceptions of God and actually, you know, one sees that even in taking the same psychedelic multiple times in different situations and on different days that it can be it can open up radically different visions radically different intuitions and feelings um, and messages um, to the point that one i think it 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 re-enlivens a theology of the part sufim of the different sort of divine countenances faces dimensions that are always sort of ebbing and flowing, expanding, contracting, transmuting. Um, so I, 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 I imagine that for people who get very orthodox about a psychedelic vision they had, probably haven't done it many times. <laughs> um, and so I, I, um, that's mostly what I've seen is people sharing um, the different sometimes surprising experiences that they've had that feel somehow theologically flush and recognizing that the next time could be a very different paradigm okay if that's even the right word for it but and that was true for arts piece you know like the very first you know mm -hmm. i mean as as, found, as foundation foundational as that was was based on like what one or two experiences right and you know he later came to have different views yeah yeah beautiful i'm conscious of the fact that we have um we are at time but uh, malila i want to give you an opportunity did you feel uh, have anything you wanted to say in response to that last thread um i would just like to add that on the optimistic side of as uh, as both of you were saying uh um, these experiences are just uh, giving more color to our Jewish experience for a lot of people. That's what's happening. I mean, and people that have been very, very estranged, you can see that a lot in Israel, people that have been very estranged or could only, you know, find any kind of connection to religious experience in India, you know, they find themselves kind of uh, the doors are thrown open and, uh, and, um, from that point of view, it's just very interesting to see, you know, what does it do to prayer? What does it do to the playfulness? What does it do to, 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 to religious imagination? And I think that on the side of discernment, yes, there's a lot of problems. You know, where people, we uh, amazing things happen to us, but people come in with certain baggage and it doesn't always like transform them and take all that away. And we are who we are. And then the question is, 
you know, what is the way that we're using this as wonderful medicine, like as tools in the art of wanting to be alive, alive in this world, alive and open, and to see that there's there's many pitfalls of all kinds. They've all been said here. I need not repeat them, but it's good to know to know the to know the danger and to know the riches and you know and and to decide is it derechi avol adam which path uh, do people want to create for themselves within that? Thank you. Well, thank you and thank you all, uh, Sam, for moderating, um, Malila J for your wise words and for Zach. Uh, who's not visible, but I, is still with us, I think. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, making this um, panel possible. There he is. Thanks, Zach. Um, and thanks for the staff uh, who, of course, make this possible in a very concrete way. And uh, be because we had this scheduled only till 1.30, I feel it's incumbent upon me to, to wrap it up for their sake, if not for ours and our audience members. <laughs> so um, for those of you who are wondering, this of course is being recorded. It will be posted and circulated um, uh, through our newsletter. So if you had to, if you, if you wanna distribute it to anyone else, uh, you, you'll be able to do so. So uh, thank you all. And um, this is, I believe, one of our last public event, online events in the center so we're soon approaching the summer and uh, we will pick this conversation up about psychedelics and the future of religion in the fall until then i wish you all the best and thank you zach mm -hmm. thanks to all of you thank you okay take care bye-bye bye-bye sponsors shefa jewish psychedelic support the berkeley graduate theological union center for the study of world religions Copyright 2023, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.